she's a mountain then you're an ocean hi everybody this is Lori, and i am the founder and ceo of inclusivity and this is our podcast inclusive talk sustainability and it's a podcast all about creativity and sustainability and equity. So our guest today, we're incredibly happy um, to announce is Rachel Z. Miller, who is a biologist. A um, Rachel, remind me of all your credentials because I've literally just forgotten them. Oh, I'm, I'm sort of a jack of all trades type, kind of master of none. I am a conservationist, the founder of a nonprofit and a inventor of a thing to protect the ocean. I, in the science world, I identify as an expedition scientist, mm -hmm. a field scientist, and uh, an informal educator as well. And you have worked with National Geographic Explorer, is that right? Yes, I'm currently a Nat Geo Explorer and also a fellow of the Explorers Club. So okay. two separate things, That's but based on the same work, to protect the planet by being outside on expeditions. And we'll get to that, I'm sure. And exploring. Exactly. So Rachel, I wanted to start, I always like to start sort of saying, how did you get to this? So your life is really dedicated to protecting the oceans and, and really pushing for sustainability, which we love. And so how did you get here? I... There's, I guess, two things to consider here. The when I look back and, and say, sort of, how did I get here? One is I am a water person through and through. Okay. Like, I literally couldn't run to save my life. <laughs> I would get caught. I am not a land animal. I am, have always been more comfortable in, on, and around the water. So, mostly doing sports swimming and competitive sailing and I've skied my entire life and I consider alpine skiing a, a water sport of sorts mm -hmm. uh, so just a love for the water I grew up in upstate New York on the lakes and rivers and my grandparents lived uh, in Margate New Jersey so every summer we spent in the salt water in the ocean pretty much all day every day and so that's kind of a big picture and then with that driving a lot of my decisions, I found myself meandering through first as a competitive sailor and, uh, and then someone who helped other people to enjoy all sorts of recreation on the water, sailing, and then I taught windsurfing and kite surfing and snow kiting and we used ROVs to connect a remotely operated vehicle underwater robots to connect people to the shipwrecks in Lake Champlain. So I really worked hard to uh, connect people to what was happening in wherever they were water-wise. So lakes or rivers or the ocean. And then that kind of all just swirled around. And as things happen, I ended up, my husband and I and our two dogs ended up on a beach off the coast of Maine right after a nor'easter. And the beach was covered in trash. It was a northeast facing beach. And that was the moment where really everything I had done somehow came together to shift to not necessarily just teaching people to enjoy activities on the water, but to protecting that venue itself. And that was just over 10 years ago. So since then, uh, We've been working really entirely on protecting the ocean, primarily through the problem of marine debris. So that's what we've really been focused on. There's lots of ways to protect the ocean. And the way the category we've chosen to work on is trash and specifically derelict fishing gear, consumer debris, and microplastic. Okay. So when you were a child because it sounds like water has always been just at always. your heart um when you were a child um did you think you'd work somehow around water did um, you know that was a thing a, that was a great question you know the only thing i remember ever wanting to be actually was an astronaut but i had really bad eyesight 
mm-hmm. from like the day I was born. And someone pretty early on told me that you can't be an astronaut if you have bad eyesight. And so I don't remember mm-hmm. ever like having that kind of specific, I want to be a thing uh, type of a goal. I was, I don't think I was, I was sort of a kid who did that. But one thing I do know is that I learned to scuba dive at 16, like right when I was sort of first allowed to. And it's, I don't know that I identified ocean or the water as necessarily being my profession, but I knew it would be part of my life. Well, and I think it's fascinating because I, I sort of equate astronauts to ocean exploration. I think there's a lot of parallels, both worlds that we don't know that we don't understand that have great darkness. I I think that um, it's kind of a fascinating connection, that that's what it is interesting. And if you think about it, the underwater lab, Mm -hmm. uh, that was used, one of the first underwater labs was used to train scientists who were going to spend time in space there. It, there's so many parallels that are pretty fascinating, and water is often used for space training. I, and, did, I and actually being able to. I did. Oh, it's cool. That. So that, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. So when you what kind of what kind of training did you go to college, and what kind of training did you get there? I did. I had a somewhat unusual college experience because I. So one thing that. I find is um, helps me understand my decision making (laughs) is that, uh, you know, when you think about how you process information and people talk about left brain and right brain and that everyone generally has a dominance towards one side or the other, there's neither is better than the other, but generally people are wired with a um, preference to, analyzing the world one with, with one of their brain hemispheres. Now, there's a small group of people, of which I'm included, that you could say is either all-brained or no-brained <laughs> without a hemisphere preference. So whenever I take those tests, I come out without a preference. And that has really played itself out in my life of being neither hard into sciences only nor hard into, say, arts only. There's there's more subtlety, but in general, you could say art and science. Um, and so, yeah, when I went to college, the, the beginning, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I had always flip-flopped between art and science. I was taking math, physics, and doing a senior project in art. That was what I did my senior year. Those were like the three final classes I was taking. So, um, so I never got really deep, deep into one of them, which is why I say like jack of all trades, but that the the lack of hemisphere preference, I think also contributes to that, not going to a PhD level in one particular thing, um, because there's so much that I'd like to, to look at. So I went to college without <clears throat> knowing anything other than I didn't want to go into medicine. I went to University of Rochester as a competitive swimmer at the time and went to Rochester to also swim on the swim team and uh, I wanted to sail, but they didn't really have a sailing team of note. It was, it was informal. And when I got there, I took lots of classes as you do. And one of the classes I took was a semiotics class. I didn't know what that was before I took it. It's the study of signs. And there was this great teacher and we looked at um, iconography and advertising theory. And it was really fascinating. I loved it. And so um, between that and the lack of sailing team, I realized, oh, I also, sophomore year, I went to Sea Education Association Sea Semester, uh, which is six weeks in Woods Hole studying oceanography, navigation, maritime history. And um, like we learned how to use a sextant. We learned how a diesel engine works. We learned also about the currents in the place where we would go. And then we spent six weeks on a spectacular uh, schooner Mm -hmm. called the Westward. She's no longer in operation. SEA has two other great boats that they run now. And uh, for me, that was a real breakthrough experience. I did it second year of my sophomore or second semester, sophomore year. And I realized that that's where I kind of had the first inkling of going into ocean Mm -hmm. sciences, perhaps as my actual vocation. 
is having done it. I've been out there essentially doing field work from a boat. I studied the currents in uh, our, we, we sailed from Miami to the Bahamas, to Bermuda, to New York City. So wow. this big East Coast sweep of the East Coast, the entire U.S. East Coast, more or less. And uh, yeah, so for me, that was a big experience. I definitely recommend it for anyone looking for a pretty transformative. You don't even have you don't have to be in sciences or in any particular topic. So I realized that Rochester was a spectacular school, but it just didn't have any more um, things I wanted to study, honestly. And I wanted to sail instead of swim at that point competitively. And so I decided I needed to transfer. Um, I had already arranged to do another uh, sort of field work experience. This was going to be first semester junior year with uh, School for International Training. And the semester was in Australia, in Cairns, Northeast Australia, studying Great Barrier Reef Ecology. So a different type of oceanographer, a different type of uh, ocean science for me. I really wanted to explore. We also did, um, we studied rainforest ecology and then Aboriginal and Islander culture. So again, for me, wanting these sort of multiples of art and science, this was a great semester. Um, and it was a great semester. <laughs> I had tried to uh, come back to a different school. I had applied to Cornell in case I wanted to go into ocean science at Brown University to study art semiotics, which was a joint major in this study of signs and art production. Yep. And my theory there was that I would sort of have a leg up going into advertising, a creative leg up, because I would have this understanding, like cultural understanding of how people react to signs and symbols and messaging from a sort of academic view and then have this production. Definitely college idealism defined right there. Like that's what that was. <laughs> and very beautiful. <laughs> oh my God. Total. Like what was I thinking? But um, so I applied to both of those schools and then Brown said they didn't want me, they wouldn't let me apply for a mid-year that they were like, well, we can tell, we'll tell you when we want you to come if we want you to come. And, uh, and so after a lot of debate, we decided that it was important to have that as a potential option. Mm -hmm. So I arranged that next semester to go on one last ocean science field program. I really was like, I need to figure out if I want to go into ocean science or into this art direction. And uh, this great program, School for Field Studies in La Paz, Mexico, studying marine mammal biology and conservation. Yeah. And it was great. We were doing real contributive field science, uh, these whale and dolphin surveys and mm -hmm. pinniped surveys and other types of work. Um, it was great field science that didn't feel like school science because it wasn't. We were it was science we were contributing. We were working with the University of La Paz professors, um, and it was a really great experience. Interestingly, my conclusion was that I didn't want to go into that type of ocean science because it was too much rep repetition. Okay, that what I learned by doing that, like real world field science, was accuracy depends on repetition, and for me. I did not want to commit to that level of same thing every day -ness. And yeah, so this is getting to be probably too long a story, but no, the I short <laughs> version <laughs> is that in the end, uh, in my heart and mind, I chose the art semiotics and sailing team at Brown Root and to just keep loving the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it worked out. I got in. So that's what I did. So I spent my last two years. So this is over five years. I spent my last two years at Brown on the sailing team, studied art semiotics mm -hmm. until there was this like crazy uh, credit snafu. And most of the way through, I was pretty much told that it's just it's complicated. I couldn't have the major that I wanted. But look, everything you've taken has more or less been cross-listed in anthropology because I was interested in this cultural yeah. relationship to art and visual cues. And so if you take archaeology and a couple of these other classes your senior year, you can still graduate on time. I had to. Like that's yeah. that was it financially. We're just so um so here was a crazy thing. 
So it turns out that one of the world's most uh, respected underwater archaeology professors was at Brown at the time. And I had not really thought about underwater archaeology. Generally, back then, you know, it, it's just something that was more like pirate booty like you know like people doing treasure hunting and it, it, it that, that that didn't interest me and before this but as i looked into it at brown his name is uh, professor richard gould and his specialty was the south pacific and i was like i don't really want to do dirt archaeology totally respect it but not my thing remember i'm not a very good land person and um Oh my goodness, if I didn't find the combination of art and science in underwater archaeology, it literally fell, I was like forced into it, fell into my lap. But in the end, that's what I graduated with, was it technically an anthropology degree, but I spent a lot of time doing um, work on underwater archaeology and even went to uh, the Dry Tortugas off the coast of Florida to do basically spend a month more or less underwater. I mean, we slept above the water, but like every day with this, with the national park services, submerged cultural resources unit. And then I went to Australia to do underwater archeology span turned into a little bit more maritime history, but it was a pretty amazing experience. Very kind of crazy academic mm -hmm. meanderings. Um, but that long story in the end I can pick each of those pieces and say that even though it was all over the place and I scared my parents often, <laughs> uh, all of it contributes to what I'm doing now. Yeah. That I look back, I know that what I learned in the art semiotics phase mm -hmm. of college is really helpful for the communications I have to do, you know, as a founder of a nonprofit mm -hmm. and even as the founder of a for profit mm -hmm. startup, that you have to wear so many hats. Mm -hmm. And arguably, you actually don't have to be the supreme expert at any one thing. That if you don't have the enough money to hire supreme experts, you got to be able to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I look back at all of that, and I couldn't have known it at the time, but it was all contributing. It, you know, at the time, I was a little alarmed at my like not being able to decide, mm -hmm. but it's all contributed. The, the, the field science the art, the archaeology. I mean, if you think about it, marine debris is kind of a form of underwater archaeology <laughs> like, or land-based when, when we, uh, and we do use ROVs with Rosalia Project, our nonprofit to, to explore underwater. So tell me about the nonprofit. So, uh, yeah, so, the, you know, between college and there, the short story is I did an Olympic campaign in sailing, but didn't make the Olympics, but had a really great experience and did all my own logistics and fundraising and stuff. Then I ran a community sailing center in Burlington, Vermont, which is pretty awesome. Right from the beginning, I was the first director. Mm -hmm. um, so it really helped grow that. And all these things are, again, planning skills and seeds yeah. and contacts to help and then it was after, uh, and then I ran a, uh, my own business, just teaching people to snow kite in the winter and kite surf, windsurf, stand up paddleboard, uh, in the summer and also do these shipwreck tours with the underwater robot. So it was those had gone on for a while. I knew that teaching kite surfing was not my it, that, that I, I enjoyed it very much and all that. And I really loved the shipwreck tours, but, um, that wasn't it. I knew it. And so that's when that moment on uh, Matinicus Island in Maine with all the trash happened. That that trip mm -hmm. was sort of five, five years into shipwreck tours, must have been eight years into storm boarding, the kite surfing and stuff. And I was kind of ready for a change. Mm -hmm. We went on that little vacation to just think and and figure out maybe what's next. And so that was pretty, pretty awesome. And that's where Rosalia Project was born. So this nonprofit uh, is dedicated to protecting the ocean. Uh, like I said, we focus on marine debris. It's grown now. We have an executive director, a great executive director. And so my role is as founder and I get to do special projects and science or education and presentations and things like that. Um, and I guess the best way to describe Rosalia Project is we are a little bit different than other nonprofits that work on marine debris. 
Uh, one is because we address the problem from multiple angles. So we have four strategies that we've used right from the start. Mm -hmm. So that's data cleanups. And the data part is to make sure that the cleanup work is valuable towards the finding solution side. And then we, on the solution side, we do prevention through education. And that's to people of all ages, including adults. We have always embraced innovation and technology from using ROVs right out of the gate to the Cora ball. And we do solutions-based research, which is really the thing that ended up connecting me with National Geographic was an expedition, two different expeditions, but ultimately this last one, uh, along the entire Hudson River, sampling the air, the water, and the soil for microplastic pollution. Mm -hmm. And so with Rosalia, in addition to those strategies, we've worked in urban and coastal waters and surface to sea floor. And so those are the kind of guiding strategies for Rosalia Project um, that I think have helped us stay relevant and kind of on the leading edge of the problem. When you work with National Explorer, um, National Geographic Explorer, tell me a little bit about what that what that is, what that means. Oh, it's such an honor. I. I will admit to lots of jumping up and down and things when that happened. Uh, so National Geographic, they have an incredibly robust grant system that they back people in whom they believe to protect our planet, to communicate about our planet, to explore and learn new things about our planet. And, um, and this group of people sort of under the umbrella of the National Geographic Society, um, they, they have lots of branches, you know, they have the media side and then they have this side. And one of their focuses of the last handful of years has been plastics and plastic pollution and how that's affecting our world, especially our natural world and the creatures in it. And so it was under that um, that heading that National Geographic supported our expedition last year. It was a, this Hudson River microplastic sampling expedition. And as the PI, the principal investigator, I became a National Geographic explorer. And um, yeah, I even still saying that like gives me a little bit of goosebumps. It, when, when you said it to me before, I was like, that is so impressive. It just Thank sounds I, wonderful and exciting, and it must, I totally understand, it must feel like such an honor. Such an honor. And and what's super cool is they they have done things like there's this science-telling boot camp that I got to do online that is about learning. You know, they're helping, they're giving us tools. They're supporting mm -hmm. us more than just here's some funding for your expedition, but they're they're working hard to help their explorer group um, be better at, at what we're doing and to connect us with each other and, and experts. And yeah, it, it is, Love it. it's one of the things for which I am most grateful. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> so in addition to this, you are the founder of Cora Ball. And I'd like you to tell us just a little bit about that, because I think what I love about you and, and, who you are is that it just feels to me like all the pieces of your life are so interwoven and they all kind of feed off each other. And in a minute, I want to ask you a little bit more about art because I think um, in my belief, being sustainable and, and taking those, making those decisions is a creative process of mm. weaving through things and figuring out what's going to work. And so I think it's all interwoven for me. Um, but the core ball, I'd just like to know how you came up with that and what exactly is it? I appreciate Why what we you all said about it? all that. Okay, so funnily enough, I've been kind of playing with one while we've been talking. <laughs> so here's the core ball. Okay, here's the story. Our clothes are falling apart in our washing machines, among other places. But our clothes are falling apart in the washing machines. And these little pieces of our clothing, that part of long fibers, become microfibers, these bits that break off. And they are so small you can't even see them until there's a lot of them together. When we learned about this problem, it got it was a long time ago, 2013, we it was just a problem that screamed at us. And we said, oh, this is going to be a big problem that our public waterways face, our ocean, our rivers, our ponds. No one is going to be immune from this problem. We hadn't 
thought of it, but when someone said it was happening, we thought, of course, that's happening. We see clothes go threadbare, but I never thought about where those threads all go. And so it was one of those kind of revelation things for us. And so we decided to do three things. One, we wanted to see if we could come up with a solution. Two, we wanted to contribute scientific knowledge to the problem, which really there was very little at the time, to uh, help understand it better, to inform both our solution and future. And three, to raise awareness about the problem, to inspire people in all the zillions of fields in which we have no expertise, as well as for consumers, uh, to, to inspire consumers to know that this problem is happening, to work on it, like from textile manufacturers to laundry machine makers, to people just remembering that our drains are connected to the natural world. And so the core of all is the solution side of that three-part goal. And we have a really great team. My husband, James, co-founder of Rosalia Project, he is the most right brain thinker I know. So he can see, like he pulls patterns out of the world. It's an incredibly fascinating thing to be able to like look holistically at a lot of stuff and draw patterns out of it. That is like a right brain or superpower. And so he's the one who kind of thought of this out of the blue. That that I think is is particularly one of his strengths. So he started with that, uh, this idea. And we had rejected other types of ideas like um, uh, putting a filter in a washing machine, that's the way this needs to go. But the reason we didn't pursue that is we knew that there'd be a very long runway. And it would take a very long time to do that, too long for our other goals. We wanted to raise awareness and we wanted our solution to help support that. Yeah. So um, so we decided not to pursue that. Um, so we decided on the c- consumer solution. And then another team member, Brooke Winslow, young team member, she at the time was about 24-ish, and she had been with Rosalia Project as an intern for a couple of years. So she is a great left-brainer. Mm-hmm. She is our technical designer. She took James's ideas and like squiggles on a napkin, essentially, and she put it into the CAD programs. She got it out of a 3D printer. She wow. made his idea look super cool and she made it real. So we say James makes it up, Brooke makes it real. And my role is twofold. One is I am reasonably good at sort of problem solving, especially like mechanical problem solving. So, um, and then I'm the communicator and the sort of speaker about it. So, um, so we say, James makes it up, Brooke makes it um, real, and I make it work. So like one of my big contributions was one of our first designs was 3D printable, but it it could not be manufactured by an open and closed mold, which was the only way to make it affordable. So that was kind of where I came in and figured out how to maintain the shape, but in an open and closed mold process. So, um, So yeah, so what this does is this collects microfibers in the wash, while it cruises around with your clothes, it tangles them up in these coral-like stalks. Mm-hmm. In fact, the design of this was inspired by coral itself and tangles them into fuzzballs eventually. Some people go fast. It happens fast. Some people it takes longer. Fuzzballs big enough to see and then take out and throw away properly so that they're not in the water, getting to our waterways quickly um, or if at all. So... Um, yeah, we're excited that we have these in washing machines worldwide, helping to stop the problem. Uh, they, they are, they've been independently tested by two different uh, universities and published peer review published papers. And they are between 26 for one paper and 31% effective, which is exactly what we had been getting in our in-house testing. Mm-hmm. We'd have gone to market at 10%. We thought it was that important yeah. that we are stopping the problem while other solutions are being developed. And we firmly believe that this is a solution situation. This is microfiber pollution, like so many of them, is where we're going to have to have a suite of solutions. And that's what I love, you know, about your book is you, in in the clothing section, you really talk about lots of different ways to kind of address all the 
multiple problems associated with clothing, but one of them does have to do with, or a couple of them have to do with this sort of microfiber issue, but thinking upstream, like what can textile companies do as far as um, their role and what can consumers do with our role? What can washing machine manufacturers do? And at some point, maybe wastewater treatment plants. Yep. Um, I think I I just want to mention to anybody who's listening that um, that's how Rachel and I met is that my book, um, You Can Save the World. In fact, you're the only one who can is out now for pre-orders. Yay! I saw Rachel's name while I was doing some research, read about um, the Cora Ball and also Rosalia project project Rosalia Rosalia sorry about that project Um, and contacted Rachel and said hey will you write a you know read my book and write a little blurb and she said yes and we had a wonderful conversation and so that's how we connected because I think our our goals and missions for the world are the same and what I love about the Cora Ball is that it's such a practical solution and what I especially appreciate and this is something that I want to get through to people with my book is that we don't have to have the whole solution to do something right we don't have to be able to you don't have to be able to solve every microfiber going out into the world in order to take a step to make fewer of them go out and I that's what I really love about the core ball is that that's exactly where it's at at that process of here's where we are right now what can we do to make it better today um, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. No, so great. when you look forward, are you hopeful? I am hopeful. I would be lying if I didn't admit to fleeting moments of ugh, like, <laughs> ooh, but I am hopeful. The foundation of my hope is in recognizing. And the way we say it is the collective we made this problem, the collective we can fix it. Certainly it is easier to break things than fix them as a universal situation. But I think, uh, however, uh, I do think, I am hopeful. I, I am hopeful. Ultimately, there are examples of consumers collectively getting companies, big companies to make changes for the best uh, without it being anything super unpleasant. You know, I also believe that um, these can be peaceful. (laughs) You know, these these switches can be made peacefully. Uh, And what I mean by that is is with a little with a little bit of kindness and saying, hey, it's pretty simple. I won't buy your thing unless these uh, the, these procedures happen. It's made of a renewable material. There's an end of life plan for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be emotional or angry. Just pretty straightforward. And I think there's opportunities for people all over the place. So there's people who maybe don't consider themselves the deciders. <laughs> but are the consumers and the fact is that consumers as a collective are the deciders yeah. but then there are people who are in positions to make decisions about materials about end of life plans for objects uh, that kind of thing and and that's why we hope to reach everyone in yeah. all the different ways we operate because yeah. uh, we believe very strongly that lots of littles make a big. You said it uh, earlier. This is the premise on which the Cora Ball is designed to say a lot of people catching a little bit of fiber means we keep a lot of it out of our public waterways. And that means it's out of the marine food web. It's out of the human food web. And it just stays where it belongs in these, to use a cradle to cradle expression, technical loops or natural loops, but to keep them looping. We are not advocates of um, regressing Mm -hmm. back to ways, you know, I'll say straight up, I'm a skier and a sailor. You've heard me talk about this. These outdoor activities are really important. And I live in Vermont and anyone who's lived in, well, and and you live in a cold place. I, I don't know if the phrase cotton kills has been said to you. Yeah. 
but it's a pretty fascinating potential antithesis to what people think we're messaging. Yeah. You know, they think we're saying don't buy synthetics. And, you know, for us, we're not, we're not saying anything in a blanket statement. Right. We're not making universal blanket statements to do or not do anything, but to make everything better. And so what that means is that little efforts to make all the things better is what's going to actually make a difference here. So that means we do need to do our synthetics better. Mm-hmm. It's unrealistic in Vermont for everyone who wants to go skiing to wear moose on the outside. Certainly, you know, the outerwear is a challenge without mm-hmm. synthetics. Synthetics are brilliant technical safety related pieces of equipment. Mm-hmm. But they're shedding, yeah. but maybe we can figure out why, and maybe we can figure out how to make them shed less. So that's where some of this upstream opportunity happens. And we think a lot about this microfiber problem and all the opportunities for innovation and all the opportunities for solutions. So that starts with making clothes more resilient. And I don't have expertise in mm-hmm. extruding resin pellets into fibers or weaving those fibers into fabrics but people do and i bet they can figure out maybe we start with the type of synthetics we use to make or maybe they get stretched into fiber faster or slower or hotter or colder or whatever um and then and then as we learn more about resiliency clothing and, and how resilient it can be at the same time us consumers can play a role about washing clothes that are dirty, but not washing clothes that aren't dirty. You know, there's, it's an interesting thing. Um, We just, uh, a colleague and friend, uh, Professor Kirsten Kapp, and I just published a paper on dryer emissions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we've been working on washing machines, but we have known or suspected since 2016, and when we did the first Hudson River expedition to look at microplastic, that Dryers are, are a contributor here, and likely a big one. Uh, and you know, we, we've been talking about this, and she gives examples that you know she's she's working to educate her son uh, that just because he's worn a garment does not mean it automatically goes in the laundry basket, unless he's been rolling around in the dirt, which happens, mm-hmm. and it can. But so there's some really great opportunities for all of us. Um, and then, of course, laundry machines, huge opportunity there to help with this particular problem, both in the wash and the dryer. Uh, yeah. Better than the other, if she's a bird, then you're a If she's a mountain